Hello everybody and welcome back to the Moshix mainframe channel. This is Moshix. And today we're going to be looking at MBS console operations on our beloved uh, TK4 distribution on top of uh, Hercules. Before we go there, just a, a brief channel announcement, if I may. Uh, we're reaching 500 uh, subscribers uh, now. Uh, uh, for me, that's a fantastic achievement. Thank you all for subscribing and for all the dozens and dozens of comments and likes on my videos. Uh, this is quite a, an achievement for me, given the humble beginnings of this channel. At the very beginning, I just wanted to make a couple of videos of things that I thought were uh, achievements by the community, really, not by me. Uh, such as, for instance, getting Jess 3, resurrecting Jess 3 and getting up and running it on, on top of MBS on, on Hercules. After 40 years, that was a very substantial achievement. No thanks to me. Um, that was done by... Jürgen Winkelmann, the maintainer of TK4, as well as by Kevin Leonard, a, uh, one of the gurus of the community. And uh, thanks to them, we got Jazz 3 done, and I just wanted to preserve an IPL of an MBS with Jazz 3 so that I could look at it again, because I just, I just, for me, it's just fascinating that software that's been dormant for more than 40 years, almost 50, 50 years, was just IPLing again and working just fine, and I could submit jobs and look at the output. I, and, and then I had MBT running, and so I, I just, I'm just fascinated by all this stuff. For me, it's just, it's just amazing that we can run software that's 50 years old, that required a giant, giant data center and computer room to just run that software. Now, um, if you want, on our tablets, I had it, or I have it running sometimes during flights on my Microsoft Surface tablet. Uh, it's just. It's just mind-bending, and I just wanted to make videos about that, and uh, and from there we've grown to. By now we're 50 videos, hundreds of subscribers, growing every day, and uh, I have ideas for many dozens of uh, future videos. But let's get to our uh, topic today: How do we control um, the MBS operating system and its subsystems from the console. I received a number of uh, comments in, in my previous videos saying, can you, can you explain, for instance, how to cancel a user that's stuck? Um, how do we start things? How do we stop things? And I realized that if you, if you watch my videos, there's always a substantial amount of console operations there, but maybe we just make a video today and, uh, and get it running. So before we go into console operations, I need to say something that's very important about the setup of TK4. I'm going to assume that you download uh, uh, TK4, um, TK4 from ETHZ. Uh, if you do that, TK4 in THC, that's the name of the college in Zurich. Uh, where Jürgen, the maintainer of TK4, works, uh, um, and they're supporting that. So you go there, obviously, you download uh, TK4. Most of you already done that. I'm just saying it for people who are um, doing this for the first time. And then you download the current here. Um, and once you've done that, um, there's a step, a substantial step, to enable the console, which we need to go through. And a lot of people uh, skip that, and then they say, well, how do I access the console? So um, let's go into that. I, I have here, I created um, a directory, MBS YouTube, we're in there now, and this is the the uh, TK4 uh, uh, tarball that I just downloaded, zipped. So we do an unzip TK4. Um, by the way, I'm running this inside a virtual machine here on my home cluster on top of, uh, which is running under ESX. So I have a bunch of uh, machines here and um, and this one is a Nook, actually, an Intel uh, uh, little machine. Uh, let me just show you. Some people sometimes ask me what's an Intel Nook uh, i7. Okay, so that's an Intel Nook. Uh, these are very small machines. Um, uh, that's how small they are. So this, they're much smaller than a can of Pepsi in this case. Um, and they can have up to 32 gigabytes of RAM. Um, I put in NVMe disks, um, like usually half a tera or a tera of NVMe disk. Uh, and then sometimes you can also add a real hard drive, depending on the model. Let's just see here what I have. Um, uh, if we go in here, this is the summary. So uh, this particular machine is 16 gigabytes um, because that's DDR4 memory. DDR4 memory right now is really expensive, so I thought I'll buy one more stick when uh, when I need it. 
but um, this is uh, okay. This is an SSD disk, uh, 250 gig. Um, you can also add an NVMe disk. Um, one of these, for instance, should have. Yeah, this or let's check this one out. Yeah, this one is 32 gig and has two disks, one half a tera and one 250. So that's a very good example. Both of these are non-mechanical disks. Those both of these are electronic disks. I could easily put in a two and a half inch, three terabyte disk. Um, very, very fast machines. If you want to do any um, serious home um, home computing um, with development and, and running ESX or other virtualization software, I, I really suggest you get uh, these nooks. They're extremely fast, especially the i7s. This one is, I think, is an i5. Oh, this is even an i3. So this machine is an i3, plenty fast at 2.3 gigahertz, has uh, four, two cores, um, two CPUs. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's plenty fast. These machines are extremely fast, especially with NVMe disks. I mean, NVMe storage just blows, makes things be 20 times faster. And you can get a machine, especially these older machines, you can get them on eBay sometimes for $150. Um, you can put another $100 of uh, DDR3 memory for the older models. Put in, uh, spend $80 on a 250 gigabyte NVMe disk or something like that. And you have a smoking machine I mean, that you can put in there probably a good 20 VMs uh, working at the same time, no problem. I have one, two, three, four, five, six of those. Um, I have a few more, but they're not configured to this cluster here. And then I have it all run, running under ESX um, 6.0, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, plenty good for me. ESX 6.5 is out already, but I'm staying with ESX 6.0 because it just works. And then um, the other thing I do is for storage. Obviously, uh, this could all they all have their own internal storage. I install usually ESX on. Um, on a USB stick on all those machines if they have an internal USB stick otherwise I just put it on the first disk uh, but then what I have is a Synology for my all my storage and uh, my Synology here um, is it's a NAS uh, has a good um, has a good I would say 20 30 terabytes of, uh, of storage it's all redundant um, I have two redundant disks so that if up to two disks fail, I will not lose any of my data. Um, so where do I see all the disks here? here. Um, some people have asked me for my home setup. So here's the setup. So I have um, about, how do I see that? Yeah, I have about 25 terabytes uh, right now, and that's using three terabyte disks. So uh, each individual disk is a three terabyte, as you can see here, some are four actually. Um, but if I upgrade those to eight terabytes, 10 terabytes, then I, have, I can have 80 terabytes here in this machine. And then I, I bundle the network uh, using uh, bonding, um, Ethernet bonding. Uh, so I have about uh, four gigabit out of this storage server to the cluster here. And that's how I operate, uh, just because some people have been asking me already. But back again to, Hercules and back again to MBS um, console operations. So um, we just unzipped TK4. Now the most important step here um, to get the console working properly is to go to unattended. There's a subdirector here, as you can see here, called unattended. You have to go in there. This is a must step for any serious um, MBS um, um, enthusiast. And you must execute this shell script there's one for windows it's the bat dot bat batch and then there's one for linux uh, set console mode so you do is dot slash set console mode if you don't do that you will not have the console available because it will start in daemon mode completely self uh, operated and that's not what we need um, so once you've done that that's when you go in here and you start mbs uh, start Hercules. Um, let's just do it again. You start Hercules by doing dot slash MBS and this starts it. And now we can uh, connect a console, uh, a, a terminal to the to this um, to this uh, mainframe instance. So 
So it's up and running already. It's running it. Um, it's doing some work. It's IPLing. And I'll very soon get into the details of uh, console work. So let's wait. This is already um, this is already a message from MBS. IEE. That's the any message that starts with IEE is the nucleus of MBS. Basically, what the people call the kernel in modern parlance. Um, and one thing to always uh, remember is that all messages have a meaning here. So um, IEA, that's typically um, the IO subsystem. IST, that's a VTAM, okay. Uh, HASP, we've said this many times before in this channel. HASP is the JS2 subsystem. Has, that's the only four letter, uh, um, four letter, uh, how we call it, a uh, message that comes out from uh, from the MBS environment. All others are three. Um, you have IED, that's um, that's the communication subsystem. IST is VTAM. So whenever you see a message, always look at the first three letters. That will tell you what it is going on. And then the last letter will tell you if, if it's an informational message. If uh, there's an S, it's a, it's a serious uh, problem. And W stands for warning. Um, there's one or two more, which I don't remember right now what they stand for, but uh, it's the I. And then this message is actually not from MBS. That's a message from Hercules. So Hercules obviously being a mainframe environment sticks to the same system for its messages. And so HHC is uh, Hercules console uh, automation because Hercules has its, and its own uh, system has a way to automate the Hercules console, which has nothing to do with MBS that's running inside Hercules. And so this are messages by Hercules. Um, and so um, the other thing to understand is that because there is a way to talk to Hercules, um, let me give you an, an example of a command that goes to Hercules. Max rates. Max rates will tell me the highest observed MIPS and I/O rates on this day, March 16. So in the last couple of minutes, and the highest it's seen, it's 33 MIPS. Which, of course, uh, back in the days, 33 MIPS was a, a mainframe that would cost easily um, 10 million dollars just a CPU. Um, uh, back in the early 90s that would have been an IBM 3090 600 with six CPUs um, which would occupy a whole uh, computer room and 2100 200, IOs per second. Now IOs per second back then 2100 would have been nothing. Um, the IOs per second has, has always been the strength of the mainframe and, um, and uh, we're still not uh, even with modern servers, we're still nowhere close to the IOs per second that the mainframes were doing 30 years ago. Uh, but anyway, so that's a, that's a, a an example of a console command that goes to Hercules. It doesn't go to the operating system running inside Hercules. Max rates. Another one would be pan rate fast. Okay, pan rate is the command that tells Hercules how how often to update this display down here. Okay, so if I go pan rate fast, as you can see here, it uploads uploads the instruction count updates the instruction counts much much faster as well as the MIPS and the I.O. per second. If I say pan rate slow, check here what's happening now. If I type enter, see what's happening? It updates just less often. The, the numbers are still correct, but it just doesn't up update as often. So I can say pan rate uh, 100 milliseconds. And of course, then it's very fast, but then this will also use more CPU. Let's see how much CPU this uses on my machine here, which is an old Dell uh, computer, nothing special. So we can see here right now I'm running at 14, uh, 16 percent. If I go pan rate 20 milliseconds, uh, it doesn't impact that much. But if I go pan rate slow, we should have. Oh, actually, <laughs> this is stupid of me. This is showing the CPU of this machine, but I'm actually running uh, this MVS. Uh, this Hercules instance on on another machine. That's why it doesn't impact anything. What we're seeing here is the impact of the screen recorder recording the session that I'm doing right now with you. So stupid of me. Sorry, disregard. Um, but anyway, these are commands that go to Hercules, and and uh, there's a whole bunch of them. You can type help, and you see all your 
uh, all new commands. Um, I can do up time. So I've been running up five minutes. Um, I can I can even stop um, and trace the instructions being executed. There's a whole bunch of uh, of uh, of uh, commands that are available here. One that's also available, which is potentially very interesting, is Suspend Hercules. You could suspend Hercules, just basically freeze everything that's running on top of Hercules, shut it down, move the whole directory somewhere else and resume it. Um, however, I've seen that in the past there are some bugs to this instruction, uh, to this command. But anyway, so there is, these are all commands that pertain to Hercules. Now, what we're going to look, at, we'll be looking at more today is the commands that go to the uh, MBS console. For any command that goes to MBS, you always have to proceed it in, in TK4. That's a configurable parameter here, so that's not set in stone. But you write D slash and then your MBS command. Let's say DT, which stands for display time. Uh, you have to do, you have, yeah, you cannot write it out, you spell it out, you have to write it shorthand DT, which means display time. And now we have MBS answering us. Also, MBS answered us here, uh, which is a well known answer IEE, that's the new close of MBS saying display command invalid because it doesn't recognize this command. And then uh, we type it correctly, slash DT. And of course, MBS only sees this part here, doesn't see the, the slash. And then it answers with IEE 136I, which is the informational message for time saying the time is uh, 11 I guess in Central Europe where uh, Jurgen uh, is based and the date is the 75th day of uh, 2018 time flies so this is how you talk to MBS now there's a whole bunch of MBS commands there are hundreds um, but we have to understand the very basics of how they work D is when we want uh, MBS to tell us something. Um, for instance, <clears throat> I just type a command here, uh, which is dm, and dm shows me <coughs> the, the status of the CPU, which means all the channels, all the um, memory, as well as the CPUs themselves. Um, and um, some commands uh, take up a lot of space, but the one interesting thing is that everything we type here ends up in the log file. Um, so there's, if we wanted to, we could go afterwards, after the session ends, after we shut down the mainframe, and look at the printout of the, the log file, and we'll see this whole output here, there, uh, in, the, in the output file. Um, so uh, let's see another command. The, U equals uh, DASD, uh, DU equals 480. So, hold on a second, what is it here? DU. Okay, yeah, sometimes I have to rem remember the commands. Um, so, um, this is a command, for instance, to show units, display all units, and then I can say which ones. Um, du dasd, which is the one I did before, and it shows us all the all the all the disk devices that this MBS knows about. Now, one thing to remember is that um, in in MBS back then and still today with ZOS, you have to configure all potential devices, even the ones that are not attached. You have to generate what's called an I/O gen, which tells the kernel or the um, nucleus of MBS or ZOS at which device, this is, will be the device address, what to find. So, you know, the way which Jurgen generated this, um, this I.O. gen here is that a device uh, 170, MBS expects to find a 3375, which uh, happens to be online. That's what O stands on for. And then it tells us the volume that it finds on that disk device and then what kind of uh, service this device is fulfilling. So it's a public device. Uh, what this means is that, um, that uh, when MBS needs to allocate a new uh, data set, it can choose to allocate on a public device. It cannot choose to allocate on a private device. 
And then, for instance, uh, this here says that on device 160, MBS expects to find a 3340 disk device, an older disk device, um, which is online and available, uh, but it's a paging device, so it's private, it's controlled by MBS directly. Um, here, for instance, there's another one which has an MBS catalog, um, and this is online. And then it also sees the ones which it expects to find there, but doesn't find right now. And of course, those those will be offline. Another way to uh, work with this is to actually put the device offline. So let's take note of that device. 192 is a 3390 modern disk, and it's offline. Um, and 190 is also 3390, but it's online, and that's volume work three. So what we can do is now, we can use an MBS command, uh, unit offline. Uh, actually, it's not M, it's a uh, very. So very, V stands for very, VU um, offline. Uh, how do we do that? VU. So that will be the command. So very um, 190 offline uh, turns uh, a, a disk offline. So it's still attached. Uh, MBS can still see it and sense the disk, but it's not using it right now. That's what offline means. So I can do now uh, display U dash mm. So why is this very command not working? Let's go find out. MBS console. And very. Okay. Very command. So this is the IBM Knowledge Center, which finds us only modern things, but uh, obviously uh, console commands are backwards compatible. So some stuff that used to work in the past would still work today. Uh, very console, very offline. Let's see how to. Um, yeah, this should work. Um, I don't know why it doesn't. Is the command for this mm, bit savers so whenever you want to have uh, information relating to older operating systems such as our MBS here you can go to bit saver uh, bit savers and then you do uh, OS VS console commands let's see what it finds I know there's a manual yeah operators library and those will be MBS system commands. Um, so these are commands that we give to MBS and and that's for release 3.7, but it's close enough to our MBS 3.8 that we can actually look at it. And this is from July 1978. So it will be a, f a very cool 40 years old manual, which we still can uh, go and read because it's still very much um, relevant to what we do. Let's see what it says here. Bit savers is sometimes a little bit slow. It's a it's a great effort. Um, this bit savers, you have thousands of manuals, not only for IBM operating systems, but any old um, computing computing system with its uh, operating systems. You have many thousands of very relevant manuals there, and and in a way, bit savers is enabling the whole retro computing thing. Uh, because what we're doing here is obviously in a way is retro computing, even though due to the nature of IBM's uh, backward compatibility which carries forward to the present day uh, it's not really retro computing alone because we can learn stuff that uh, that's applicable to ZOS uh, one to one almost uh, so let's see what it finds here maybe we can search very
Okay, so it's a it's an extensive manual, and I read it in the past. I should update myself, as you can see. I've forgotten quite a few things, um, but I I shall look into this again. Uh, this now, right now, is talking about the display, which is something we need to get into as well in this session. So, use the control we want to vary console mode. This is still talking about console right now. You can see here, these are all commands that will go into the console here. There's, there's, it's a very, very extensive system. Um, but before we get there, um, let's just continue first and and and, um, and and see how to operate specifically TK4. Because one thing to understand is that TK4, TK4 has its own console uh, automation software written by the TK3 uh, maintainer has stopped maintaining TK3. That's why Jurgen is now maintaining TK4. And he wrote uh, something called the, um, the console operator automation. And we can go have a look at it running right now in TK4. Now, the one thing that most operators will use most, the one command most people use the most is display all running jobs. So slash DAL, this shows us all the, com all the address spaces all the jobs are currently running on the system the most important one of which obviously is just to without just to the mainframe uh, will not operate properly we there's not going to be a way to schedule work to be submitted to the mainframe that's kind of the yeah, think of just to as the as the means to introduce work to the mainframe and to look at the output of that work uh, the, you can you can start you can start some work without just two but just two controls all the spooling devices the card readers the the the, the output uh, devices um, the card printers and the printers of course themselves uh, and and um, without it um, without just two you would have to print directly to the printer and if you print directly to the printer then nobody else will be able to print to the printer during that time so you don't have garbled output but just to virtualize it, all those serial devices such as printers or card readers so that many people can write and then first goes to disk and then from the disk it will be outputted to the printer and so the just to is the most important address pass here if just to doesn't come up there's really very little you can do uh, on the MBS level and then um, there's there's several other which pertain to TSO is the environment where we log in and do interactive work obviously very important address space as well but we could do most of the things we can do in TSO interactively we could even do once we have just two running by just sending batch jobs and, and doing stuff and then we have dot net uh, sorry net is the VTAM um, communications uh, controlling software very important as well and some other stuff which is less important but as you can what you can see here is the pilot bsp pilot bsp stands for band key systems programming and that's the company of uh, your of volker the person the, who authored uh, tk3 the predecessor of tk4 and um and then he has another address space which interacts with the console so um bsp pilot automates all of the uh of the console so that you can actually start MBS and leave it running for months, never really have to worry about anything. It sees all the messages that come out and responds to them. If the if the uh, spool gets full, it starts to uh, deal with it and, and, and many other things. But um, what I wanted to say is that um, you can um, still do everything manually and you should learn how to do it. And that's why we're having this session today. So um, this, this plays you what's going on now as you can see before here there was we got some messages on the console that MF1 is printing 205 lines on a printer on printer one MF1 is the recorder of the environmental recorder within MBS there's an environmental recorder which records everything that's happening in uh, almost real time onto a file um, and then I call the EREP file environmental recorder program file and from there, MF1 is the reporting tool which will then print out regularly at 15 minutes intervals if there's many errors, uh, how much usage there's been, who used what, etc. Um, which is useful in a very product in a very busy productive environment 
a production environment, but I, within my system, the first thing I do when I IPL is I cancel it. So how do we cancel? And here you can see it running. It schedules itself to uh, wake up at 15 minutes and print out um, the latest EREP um, output to a printer. And it kind of bothers me. So I could disable it if I go to the configuration of MBS, obviously, but um, right now we're doing console operation. So I do can C for cancel MF1. The name of the of the job is the important thing here. I could specify also the job number. There's a way to do that, but we don't need it because there is only one job called MF1 right now. So um, by issuing the cancel, I get the kernel, the nucleus of MVS is telling me cancel command accepted. And then it abends, ab abnormally ends. Ab abend stands for abnormal end with 222, which every MVS person will recognize as the uh, as the a band code for a job that's been cancelled by something. Uh, it could be the operator, time limit, etc. 522 would be time limit. All the two twos are time are cancelled, and then two is the reason. So uh, two is operator five would be time limit, etc. And then um, the time, and it ended. And of course, the job needed to print out that it ended, and they printed that out of printer two, and now printer two is inactive and MEF1 is purged from the system. Now you can see here there's two systems talking to us. There's IEE, which is the nucleus of MVS, and then we have HASP, which is the Houston Automatic Spooling Program. That's what HASP stands for. As you can see here, the only four letter code in, uh, in the MVS uh, universe. Um, tells us that MVS ended because MVS, M MF1 was started through JS2. That's why JS2 is telling us that it ended. And then it tells us that it printed out some stuff rel relating to the ending of this job on printer 2. And uh, and then it tells us that it's out of the system now. And JS2 does not control this job anymore because it's out of the system. So this is how the console works. Now, the other important thing is that the MVS console is interactive. So uh, at times, the MVS wants certain responses from us. And how do we see if there's any outstanding responses? We do DR replies outstanding. And it will say, it will tell us right now there's no outstanding request. Okay. This is the way for us to know that there's no outstanding request. If there was one, we would, we would be receiving here um, certain messages on the screen. And for me to show you how to, um, how to generate the message that we need to answer to, I'm going to do something very drastic. I'm going to stop JS2 in a brutal way. I'm going to I'm going to force it to stop. Sometimes JS2 doesn't want to come down if it's still waiting for certain printers or for certain lines to be drained. And if they're not drained, JS2 will refuse to come down. And in those instances, if something is hung, you need to cancel it. Uh, some people have asked me, how do you make JS2 stop if you really, really want to go it down? So you do like this. Uh, um, just to oh no oh sorry um, it's going to be uh, p just to so now whenever you put in uh, as you can see here the slash is telling Hercules pass this on to MVS now here's a new thing um, there are certain subsystems subsystems in MVS have their own control character just to by default it's a configurable parameter parameter has the dollar sign so whenever you put in a dollar at the beginning of a command MVS knows that it needs to pass this command to JS2 here. So, the, and then we have P for stop, and then JS2, um, and then we tell it JS2 abend. Okay, this is a command that tells JS2 to immediately stop itself, to, to issue an abend, and go down ungracefully, um, which means it's uncertain if JS2 will ever come back up again after that, but just for for uh, the purpose of showing you the reply uh, commands, let's do this. Okay, so now we issue that, and now JS2 is down. What you see here is JS2 talking to us, catastrophic error, because we abandoned it, code PJ2, JS abandon analysis. This is the module, the, the binary that was executing, and it tells us what uh, PTF program temporary fix was applied to it basically what breed, what um, fixes, IBM fixes have been applied to it. And then it tells us just release 4.1, of 
course this is an ancient version of Jest 2. Um, Operating should be just to a band. So it, it recognizes that this was an event which was triggered by the operator, which is us. And then we have the register output. Now, at this point, ASP uh, is telling us enter termination option. It's almost down. It just needs to know how to terminate. So if you go here now and type again, show me all outstanding uh, replies, pending request 490. Summary, one reply ID, one reply ID. It's telling us HASP 98, enter termination error, um, option. So now we need to give it an option to terminate. So we say reply 00, zero because that's a reply code. Every reply, outstanding reply will have a code associated with it. So you can answer to that reply request. And you, then you say reply 00, zero dot purge means just purge the output, um, the abend dump. Okay, so now JS2 is down. Let's see what happens to the rest of the system. So we don't have JS2 here anymore, as you can see. TSO is still up and running. Um, I could still log in. You can see here. But there's right now no way, because JS2 is not running, there's no way to introduce any work to JS2. As you can see here, TSO starts to get very confused because it's looking for a way to connect to JS2 to establish a connection in case that a programmer wants to submit some work to JS2. And that's why JS2 is already very confused. Um, so this machine is not gonna go anywhere. And now let's see how we would take this machine down. So uh, if, you if you do um, a display all, you will see that there is now one more additional output before we had uh, active TSO users out of 40 configured. Now we have one active TSO user. And I remember there was a question in my one of my previous videos on how to cancel users. Um, so this, this user here is a kind of stuck now. And how do we cancel this user? Well, we know it's it, this command here, DAL, is telling us that, that the active user is herc01. And it's on. It's signing on. That's the state that this user is in right now. So we can cancel this one by doing cancel u equals herc zero one. Okay. So you will see that sometimes it accepts the command, but still doesn't cancel it. It's still there. Um, how do we force? Okay, so right now this task it is is in a, is in a state which cannot accept any out input output because it's stuck waiting probably for just two. Um, so in this case, uh, let's see how do we um, force her to one arm. Yeah, so arm sometimes is what you tell it to force it anyway, and it's still not working. So this user is completely stuck. And what you do in this case, well, there's not much you can do. Uh, the best thing to do um, is here, a TSO is still telling us, it's still proceeding, but it's not really doing anything. Let's see if we cancel this console, um, if we can then cancel this user. So this user is gonna be connected to some kind of console. Um, and uh, there are VTAM messages uh, to disable a console mostly. Uh, we can by the way there's a great page um, about console operations how do I, you can set some function keys in the console um, uh, one thing that I wanted to sh show before but then I didn't get to it is you, if I wanted, only wanted to show the online DASDs, I can do like this. And this will show me all the online disks. If I want to see only the ones that are offline, I can do like this, even more interesting. So there's only one tape device which is online right now. Um, if there is a message at the top of the console we want to remove, we can do uh, K, um, uh, ED, uh, there's many things. So 
um, oh here is the one we just had like our, uh, hasp termination option you can say our dump snap purge exit okay here is a way to disable a console uh, let's put this here oops what did I just do oh that's good. that's good as well windows in this case was smart so let's do a v very net inactive id that would be c u u z oh, that's one u too many okay so let's see what happened to my um, new session that will be then 0 c1 oh okay so it's very offline so sometimes it's stuck so much that you can't really recover it id equals c u u 0 c channel it is being deactivated so in this case even vtam failed to deactivate this uh, this display here, this 3270 device. So this machine is now, because Jazz 2 is not working, it's royally uh, confused. Um, so we can see how to recover from that. Um, so let me go back here again to this. Okay, let's close this console for now. Um, and let's try to recover from the situation. First of all, we need to have a Jest 2 running. So let's start a Jest 2. And the command to start the job will be start Jest 2. Now, how does MVS know where to find Jest 2? Uh, um, most people think Jest 2, I, you know, MVS just knows where it is. It doesn't just know. It knows where to find it because it's in something called a sys1. Dot, all right, here, sys1.proglib or any concatenation thereof it will find the procedure called JS2. And that's what uh, MBS goes to execute when I, I can write here, Mickey Mouse, and they will go look for it in sys1 proclip, and we'll say there's no Mickey Mouse procedure called this thing. And anyway, the command will be too long. Mickey. Okay. And, it's, and it will say there's no Mickey here anywhere. So, um, so to start, but Jest2 is a procedure in, in, in that library. So we start with Jest2. Okay, and now Jest2 is starting to come up and says it wants to have some parameters. And so we'll say reply 01. Why is it one? Because we already had 00 before. So this is the second reply request in the system. And it will start to count up um, up to a certain point. And, and then if all the ones have been removed, reply, reply request, it will start to reuse those. Uh, zero one, and I will say no request. Okay, so now Jest two is starting to is coming up, and it's trying to start all the address spaces which we already had running. Um, so MF one is, is running again. So let's cancel that MF one. And okay, so now things are proceeding. Uh, we see here last step completion. It was canceled, logged off. So now Herc01 was logged off because Jest2 was available again. The, our original command to cancel user Herc01 was accepted. And um, and in fact, uh, there's no more active users. So we did recover this user here. And so now what we need to do is vary this console online again. So we just say here, oh, this display very and then um, where's the command uh, let's take it here very net which talks to vtem activate id equals cu u0 c0 okay so now this display is active and as you can see it's back again responsive so now I can log in again, in theory. Yeah. And this time we're logged in. Okay, so we did recover this, uh, this user and this display. Um, this is an important command set here. 
I often have to go look it up again, but um, um, that's uh, that's how it works. One thing also that that I see here, which is very important, needs to be needs to be outlined, is that um, when there's too many messages here in the console, and it will fill up um, wait. WTO means uh, write to operator, and there's a buffer on how many reply requests can be outstanding. And there's too many messages out there that haven't been they're filling up the buffer, either from reply requests or from messages from MVS. Um, you will get a reply. Um, you get a message from the from the MVS nucleus saying that there's a shortage of buffers, and um, and so to to uh, disable that, then there is command called um, KAF or KBF. Um, there is a command MVS console What is it again? Let's see here B C D it will tell us so there's a command here which tells us about the WTO buffers um, and we see here that this is console 900 and right now we're not full um, but there is a command which I have to go and look up usually um, how do we respond to that this is what we just saw See here, there's a K command. I don't remember what the K command is. Ah, oh, yeah, KQ. KQ. Okay, if you have full, uh, now I remember it. Uh, this is a very handy website here. I often have to come back to this website. So KQ means um, flush the, uh, the Q, the buffers. And they will usually, but not always, regain uh, control of the MBS uh, console. So that's a KQ is, is one to remember, and I should have remembered it. And then again, this is the way to see what's going on with the consoles. Now, we can also, uh, what do you do if you're connecting remotely to a system where you don't have access to the hardware console like this? Um, to do that, there is a way within TK4 to access the console, and that's within the IMON monitor. Um, Greg Price is amazing software. I just like it a lot. Um, so let's go in here, make it a little bigger so we can look at it. Okay, and there is um, a console here in O. You have to be a privileged user, obviously, for that because the console is a privileged environment. What's happening? Yeah, so we're there and um, my system is a little slow. I think it's the screen recording slowing down my keyboard a little bit. Um, yeah, it could also be that the system is just uh, a little bit too messed up because I shut down Jess 2 from underneath it. Um, so let's try again to do this. Eric, zero, cancel user. Eric 01, and in this case, as you can see here, it worked instantly, and the display is available again. Um, let's shut down MBS and let's start again. Uh, FBSP pilot. So F means force, and we're talking now. It's a way to talk to an address space, and if and the way to shut down TK4 is to tell BSP pilot to do it for us. Um, the other way to do it would be. Well, let's do it manually, actually, since we're doing console operations. Let's shut down M MBS without um, the help of the console automation software. So first of all, let's cancel everything that we don't need, such as CMD1. Let's cancel BSP pilot. Okay, now um, we're gonna say uh, stop TSO. And we say, you. 
Okay, so now TSO is down. And now the thing that takes the longest to shut down is VTAM because it controls so many lines. Um, so we're going to say um, ZNet quick. Let's shut it down the quick way, which still takes a couple of minutes. And you can see here all the nodes and all the lines that are configured here. Uh, there's so many. Um, because one thing that most people are not aware of is that Jurgen has written a 3705 emulator for TK4. So most terminals that we connect, they don't actually connect through the channel. They connect through a uh, TK uh, through a, a communication controller, Fabian 3705. Well, let's see how this. If you can get a picture of it. I I had seen some of those in back in the days. Um, yeah, the 3705 communication controller. It looks like a mainframe on its own. It is a computer, and the way it worked is that the mainframe would talk to this computer, and then this computer would control all the lines so that it would um, offload all that work from the mainframe. And it really speeded up things quite a bit. And you needed a, a, um, a communication program called NCP to talk to it. And, um, and so Jurgen emulates all of that stuff. It's, most people aren't even aware of that, but it's just amazing the stuff that Jurgen has done with TK4. Once you start scratching below the surface, you see amazing engineering work. Uh, the modern version of the IBM 3705 was is the 3745. Um, they used to be giant machines to becoming smaller and smaller, smaller. So this this is the one. That's how it looks like a modern 3705 looks like. Um, but there is the older version of that were much much bigger machines, but may easily eight ten times bigger than this one. Um, yeah, this is how an old one used to look like. That's exactly that's exactly it. Um, yeah, so uh, this is, yeah, that's a 3745. Um, so uh, 3705 is the predecessor of the predecessor of this one, but we have that enabled. And so VTEM controls that through NCP, and that's why it, sometimes it takes a while to shut down. Um, and let's see here where we are. So in the meantime, <coughs> um, we can cancel certain other things which are not important. The SNA, SNA is kind of, when you think of TCP IP in the modern world, in the old world, in the mainframe world, still used today, you have SNA, Systems Network Architecture, just a different protocol. And there's SNA SOL is the solicitor for SNA, something related to networking, we don't really need that. Cancel that down, let's shut down this machine. JRP, uh, we don't need that. Um, and then we have the TP processing, that's that's the NCP emulator that talks to the 3705. So we can just cancel that. It will recover on the next IPL because it's stateless in a way on its own. Um, and so we still have to wait for VTAM to come down. Okay, and that is it now. VTAM has come down. There must be an IST message yeah, here. Uh, those are the IST messages. VTAM is now inactive. That's what you want to wait for. And once we have that, we only have JS2 running, so we can do P JS2 comma term. So dollar, we're talking to JS2 here. Uh, stop JS2 terminate. Okay, now we have this situation where JS2 is telling us it cannot shut down it because it's not dormant system draining. And we can try to see what it is. It's these lines here. I guess these are the lines that it haven't drained. Uh, you should dollar DU for uh, devices. And so in this case, we have to shut it down like I did before, just to bend. And then we reply either purge or exit. Oh, I didn't like that. So let's say purge. That's the other thing. If you, I can, I can put in here, Mickey, for Mickey Mouse. And it will keep asking me again because it needs to have an answer. And it will go in indefinitely. So I say reply 5 purge because that's I know that's what it's looking for. And now we have no more jobs running, no users online. We still have to tell it to close the, um, the syslog log file. Um, uh, sorry, uh, this closes the SMF. The SMF is system management facility. It's a recorder of everything that happens, who does what, when, and why. And um, it's, a, it's a recorder as well, and needs to be shut down. 
and then we do quiet which means it flushes all the pending outputs on the channel on the channels and so once we did the quiet the machine is now stopped it's and uh, this will be similar to uh, the real mainframe just being completely stopped still powered on and to power it off the switch to power off will be quick and that's it and you can see here the this terminal also died let's start it again okay it's coming up again uh, mvs is not up yet because yeah now mvs is up as soon as we see these messages here from hasp etc so let's reconnect this mess this uh, display and this now we should have a much more responsive system let's wait for this to come up So the system is up. As before, as you know, I don't like the MF1 uh, output producer here, so I cancel it, not need it. And lines are still coming up. This is VTAM, as you can see from the IST messages. But we can already log in. So we log in, and let's go again to uh, look at the console. So what we want to do before, oh. Okay, so now we have, um, we have a console uh, running and this this if you press f1 you get this help uh, screen this monitor can only be invoked in an apf authorized environment which it is tsa operator privilege is required to invoke this monitor that kind of and the spy command with active this active command mode. data overflow okay so i can this console has master authority this console has system authority as io authority this is the various authorities for consoles um okay so let's do it like this um, and you can see here, if I type the commands here, the output comes in this, in the hardware console. You can see here, how do we get output uh, on this console? There's a way to do it. Um, help. Yeah, release display, freeze display. Okay, so switch display to system log buffer. There's several options here. So let's see what we can do. So let's check R, F, N, and B. Okay, N. Yeah, so there's a way operators, and I remember that from the old days, we used to have operators sitting at the consoles all day. That's what they were looking, just looking at this display here. Uh, maybe you can have a picture of that. Uh, how do you mainframe operator images? Well, the, this is the very previous version of the console when it was a hardware console with buttons and then it mi migrated to uh, teletype. And then later on it became something you would have on a screen just like this one. As you can see here, there's a there's a console attached to this computer here, this 3070. But let's see if you have a picture of, of people at the console. Well, here's a console operator right here. Um, but let's get a better picture. Here, here would be typical setup. Two uh, operators, uh, one operator with two consoles. Well, one could be a Jest 2 console, one could be the MBS console. Here's the mainframe. But we want to see one actually. Here's another console operator. Here's another console operator. Um, this is, those were teletype machines, so you would type and go on printer on paper. Um, so I can't find a good picture now, but. Um, IBM mainframe operator. Let's see if we can find a good picture. Sometimes you would have a whole wall of screens and people would sit at those screens and just monitor them all the time. Eventually, software replaced most of that. I can see a good one here. 
Oh, here is very, uh, this is a very good picture. Um, so this is 1997, not that long ago, 21 years ago. Yeah, these are all consoles, but let's see the mainframe console. Yeah, this would be it. So you can see yeah, they used to have three or four screens. Sometimes there was like a wall with 20 screens and more sophisticated. I've seen one at EDS in Dallas. Um, about 10 years ago, I was in the mainframe uh, network operating operation center and they had a whole like kind of like um, the screen you had in the movie uh, what is it called um, about the hacker um, what's it called uh, that almost caused the nuclear war I can't remember the name of the movie right now um, if you if you can remember it could you please post it in the uh, comments below this video but this is how the console used to be and so people used to sit all day here and it would be very noisy very cold and they would reply to console messages all day long. Um, and the operators were kind of the lowest in the hierarchy of the mainframe people. So there were the, the operators, then there were the programmers above them, and and then there were the system programmers. And within the operators, there was also a hierarchy. There were the MBS console operator was the kind of the head operator, the chief operator. And then you had an operator just for tapes. They had a console just for tape requests, or she. And then was a print operator. Those were usually the junior junior people just got started on the job would be printer or tape operators and then you would move up and be a JS2 operator or JS3 operator or then an MBS operator um, and those would be working in two or uh, three shifts usually of eight hours each because the mainframe works all the time obviously so this is how this used to work okay so um, let's see if we can get this um, get here any Okay, so now we're in log buffer display. Let's see if we... I can't really find a way to... So if I type F here, it changes here to F. If I type R, it changes to R. But I cannot see any traffic here. Let's see here. Okay. Nope. Still not going there. Nope. I remember I've done this before. Um, B. Hmm. I don't know what this means. TSU four here. Um, let's do this again. Switch display to system console ID. Close it again. Switch, okay. C01. Yeah, I cannot figure this out. If anybody figures out how to make this console actually show that, I know it, it is working, but it's not showing me any, uh, any output. I know I had done this before. still shows up here scroll up a page scroll down um, so it needs to be in R and then Yeah, I can figure this out. This should show the log. And this command will be entered into the log, so I don't know why it's not working. But anyway, I, I, I will maybe figure it out uh, talking to Greg Price and then get back to you guys. But uh, there's a lot of stuff you can do with the interactive monitor, including uh, talking to the console. Another way to talk to the console is by uh, is by um, going to um, a 
Okay, so this host here is running on this IP address, uh, 192.168.148. If you go to port 8038, you get the a graphical access, which I think a lot of people will like, um, is access to the console here. And obviously, if you sh if you if you making this host visible to the internet, make sure to disable this port because otherwise, people may be able uh, will be able to access your console and stop your machine and do crazy stuff with it. Um, but you have here the, your view on the on this web page of your system, and um, you can configure it online. You, you can do all the stuff you can do in Hercules. You can you can do here. So I can look at the registers, storage, miscellaneous devices. I can see all my devices here. Version info. This is her, uh, Hercules 4.0. Somebody had asked in the comments, what is the Hercules version in, in uh, TK4? It's, it's a modified version of Hercules 4.0 with some additions by Jurgen. And um, system log and IPL. I can uh, do an IPL here. So, But if I go to system log, I can issue your commands such as uh, this one. And no outstanding request. Okay, and so I can control the host also from this web page, but be sure to disable it if you're making your host visible from the internet. Um, and it's just like having access here. Same thing. Um, I can also do auto refresh every two seconds. So now if I do Mickey for Mickey Mouse, then uh, it will sh it will refresh here and show it here as well. Okay, only low show last 22 lines. I can do 60. Uh, I have to stop refresh. Okay. So I can look at the whole syslog here. Okay. So everything that goes in the console also goes into the log. So this is a little introduction into how to operate your mainframe from the from the console. We looked at how to stop users, how to disable displays, enable them again if they get stuck. Um, how to start stuff, how to start, shut down MVS, how to shut down Jest2 when it's stuck, etc. etc. Um, this gives you a very good overview. I think we've gone far enough in this video. Um, I think it's time uh, to call it uh, quits here. And um, if you have any questions, please uh, post uh, comments uh, below this video. If uh, you have any other remarks, please do so. You can also contact me directly by uh, YouTube messages. Um, or by email and uh, thank you very much for uh, watching this video please do subscribe to the Moshex main mainframe channel to get notifications of future videos if you like this particular video press on the thumbs up button and see you soon on the Moshex mainframe channel thank you very much goodbye